cool. Talk so, hello everybody. I'm sure, and I'm sure some will some will join afterwards also. So today's topic is environmental impact on well, how you and your startup idea are influencing our world here around us, and uh, just a few remarks. Uh, five years ago. Everybody told, uh, spoke about CO2 and uh, greenhouse gases and stuff. To, today, we are talking about uh, much more than just uh, CO2. We're talking about uh, biodiversity. We talk, we talk about pollution, which might not necessarily be a CO2 pollution or GHG pollution. We are talking about ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance uh, on our Mexican restaurant meeting, Kiriana said that uh, Prototron invented that. Good to hear. I didn't know that. I thought it was invented somewhere in Europe. But... No, I haven't invented it. <laughs> that we invented the tool how to measure it. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Done. Cool. <laughs> anyway, but the other other reference to Jana is that uh, if you didn't know, Jana is associated with a new upcoming uh, green investment fund, the Better Fund which has really ambitious goal being the SFDR Article 9 fund, which is really ambitious. And, and uh, uh, who knows, that knows, but for those who don't, uh, it stems from uh, this uh, green evaluation concept called EU taxonomy. There are basically two kinds of uh, green funds, the light green and dark green, the SFDR Article 8, which uh, is basically a money uh, ded dedicated to the uh, business cases which aim to provide positive influence in the world in, in the environment uh, but uh, but it's just as a mandatory part of the project but it's not all what the project is or not uh, not the first first uh, kind of aim of the project uh, article 9 is much more ambitious it's called dark green also because it puts this uh, greenness and positive environmental impact also in the forefront of every, uh, among the other criteria there. Jana, you can uh, correct me if I'm a bit wrong. Uh, so it's it's really kind of from the from the kind of investor point of view, it's probably more ambitious and more difficult because there is always a danger that that. Uh, you might sacrifice part of the growth and, and the monetary revenue for the positive impact. Is it true or how do you see it? Yes, uh, from one side, our percentage might be a little bit uh, not so ambitious as the growth of money. But uh, the most important and the most complicated is that we are bound to not only to bring money back, but we also bound to bring real impact. And even if the money is there and a lot, but the impact is not, we will not get our money. So this is uh, uh, this is how like really really strict um, position from European Commission how they want to guide and uh, direct the green politic. So mm -hmm. let's see. But yeah. so please so, be, uh, listen very carefully what Indrek is saying. So I I need this pipeline of the impactful <laughs> topic <laughs> teams so everybody of you should at least aim for the eligibility into the article 8 funds and uh, better even if, if you get into the article 9 and uh, it's it's a difficult uh, difficult field for the investors also uh, for the venture capital investors who actually deal with the companies, how invest in the companies, uh, for them, if you Google, there are a lot of so-called impact funds, but very few who actually put this impact heavily in, in the front and then deliver and stay in, uh, stay in business also. We see that occasionally there are uh, big news four or five years ago already that uh, the impact fund have started and then a couple of years later they silently and quietly go out of business and then there is a comment that sorry but our LPs or limited partners still wanted the money in exchange of of, of the impact and this, this is actually a bigger problem on the market and then a lot of people talk about it right now because 
uh, well, in Europe, the biggest LP is European Investment Fund, uh, which, uh, which uh, if the EU, EU policy is supported, then I'm sure that they are willing to invest in Article 9 funds also. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, significant, well, probably the biggest group of LPs are the pension funds. And the problem with pension funds is that at the one, uh, one moment they have to pay the pensions to, the, to their investors, to the people who put their money in the pension funds. And you cannot pay the pensions in, in good impact or carbon credits or anything like that. You have to pay it in money, which means that for these LPs, money comes first and everything else is kind of bonus. And this is where the conflict probably might be with the, with the Article 9 funds, because LP strategic invest is uh, strategic interest is to to get the monetary returns uh, before the, the positive impact. But maybe in this area also some kind of solutions will emerge. Uh, maybe maybe public uh, there are always public investors also. Um, EIF probably can also be considered that this semi public money and. Uh, at least in theory, it's possible that uh, public uh, investment takes a small kind of cap on their productivity in order to boost uh, private investors' uh, productivity in exchange um, software values, for example. I'm yet to see a fund structured like this, but I'm, I'm sure it's not impossible. At least I've heard this kind of discussions. So let's see what the future brings. So all this uh, talk is to just emphasize how important this uh, this uh, field is going to be also for, st for startups. If you have heard about ESG, uh, today banks hire ESG specialists already. Um, uh, Swedbank, LHV, in these banks I know personally the guys who, who do this evaluation. Uh, they have the obligation to evaluate their uh, loan portfolios and investment portfolios ESG score. Uh, it, uh, I'm not sure how many companies in Estonia, maybe around 10, have the mandatory ESG evaluation also, or the environmental accounting, as it's called also. Uh, it will probably trickle down uh, in next years towards uh, smaller companies and towards startups also. So in one moment of time, you all have to do this environmental imp uh, impact calculation or environmental impact accounting in your companies also. So it's good to be aware of the kind of intervention points or, or the impact points already when you start. And, uh, and this is what we are going to discuss today. I'm not going to do you a training in the monologue format because a lot of this ESG stuff is still in the process of development, and then um, there is no, no, not many formulas or, or ready tools uh, which are kind of market standard or anything. This, this market is still rap rapidly, but still it's still maturing. So probably in a, in a year we are already in completely different landscape where we are right now. And that's it, uh, the intro words from my side. Does anybody else who maybe knows more about me than, than I do about these topics or, or has some, some insights, um, wants, wants to add anything or are we handing the floor over to Harold? I guess not. So let's try to be as effective as possible. Let's uh, introduce in one sentence what you are doing, if possible. Two sentences is also also okay, and then let's go through your slides. Or, or if you don't have the slides prepared, then just tell us uh, what your vision about your environmental impact is and the intervention points there. And then uh, the microphone is open. Basically, I try to moderate it. If possible, please uh, raise your hands before you start talking. There is a reaction option in in Zoom where you can raise the hands. And I try to keep an eye on the clock also, so that uh, we are not spending half an hour on one company. But if um, discussion is really interesting and, and useful, maybe in giving insights to others also, then I'm not too rudely uh, cutting you. I have a question. Yes, please. Sorry that I can't turn on camera now. 
So the, catch, uh, the question about the uh, using methane gas for preparing food. Is there any research about the impact on the health from the food that was cooked on the natural gas? Mm, like what's I don't the difference? Know the out outcome, well, if the methane itself is pure, then there are no harmful to health. Uh, well, depends on concentration, of course, but uh, but uh, exhaust from there. So it shouldn't have any any negative impact. But I know that there are many engineers in our our crew here. So maybe somebody can elaborate on this. Joseph, please. Um, Indrik, a quick uh, question. Speaking about ESG, do you know if the... Oh, I thought you have anything to add on the last answer. Or not? Oh, no. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Does anybody have to add anything on methane? I think uh, it shouldn't have any negative direct impact on the food quality, at least. If it's not polluted, if it's not contaminate, contaminated with anything else. Uh, I'm actually, sorry, I'm yes. the chemist. <laughs> and, Ooh, uh, thank you. And uh, actually, the methane that comes from uh, uh, biomass contains uh, a whole lot of sulfur. And uh, sulfur uh, burns, uh, giving us sulfur oxides which bring uh, um, the acid rains and uh, a lot of health issues so it's uh, sulfur and sulfuric acid uh, which are really bad uh, from methane that comes from biomass and it should be thoroughly uh, purified it's the main problem from most of these biomass facilities and it costs a lot yeah so a pure methane, a CH4, it doesn't contain sulfur, no, but the no. contamina potential contamination and mixes is the problem, right? Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, good. Okay, does anybody else want to add anything to methane question or shall we take the Joseph question? So, Joseph, please. Uh, yeah, thanks. thanks I had a question about the, yeah, about the E part from ESG. Yes. I was wondering if you know, it includes only basically climate impact based on the greenhouse gases, or it goes broader. Like uh, to my broad? knowledge, it goes broader. Okay. It, it should. Con uh, um, I I know the Michael uh, Michael who is um, previously did it in LHV DSG uh, scoring, and now he works in uh, Swedbank. Yeah. To my understanding, it has significantly broader focus, and and it's quite a tricky field. Okay. I was particularly wondering if it contains also includes black carbon, you know, black carbon emission. Uh, I'm not sure, but I understand having a very brief understanding about the concept. I don't think the, the list is uh, limited or closed. It, okay. uh, it at least tries, I think, to take into account or be open to all kinds of negative impacts in all okay. kinds. I think so, but yeah, you can you can ask me afterwards. Uh, I know people who do this as a job, job this ESG evaluation, and I can ask it uh, directly from them. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So, Harold, the floor is yours. So let's go. So, hello. We are the Biogas Collective. And we want to uh, build such a system as seen on the picture for uh, rural homes. And uh, here you can basically take any kind of biological waste, you turn it to uh, methane, which is fuel and uh, compost. So the environmental impact is one of the main reasons why we want to do this. Uh, through our products, we are uh, mitigating climate change and reducing uh, dependency on fossil fuels. We are also promoting energy independence, food independence, uh, circular flow of nutrients, and uh, green lifestyle overall. Uh, we want to make it from uh, locally sourced uh, eco-friendly materials as much as possible. So we could also provide an alter alternative to solar panels for which the materials we have to import in Estonia. Uh, so let's move on. 
state of the art. Here is some uh, examples of how they do it in uh, Nepal or in the USA. And there's also the example of how Estonia in Coxware, this station we used to actually refuel our car there when we had the Fiat Multipla, which was going on uh, biogas. And then recently I found out that also in uh, Scotland, there is one uh, eco village community where they also built the system it's, uh, based on the Nepali design, but it's inside the greenhouse. So it would work in the winter as well. And this is pretty much the thing we actually want to uh, make for uh, Estonian people also. Uh, and this is to show the growth of biogas in uh, uh, Europe. Here is uh, the growth is shown in um, kilotons of oil equivalent. So this is all the oil and the natural, uh, uh, the fossil fuel that we did not burn, but used uh, biogas instead. And because of our products, uh, we are um, reducing the greenhouse gases. We have also thought of uh, going through the carbon offset market through our products, but this is something we are still uh, looking into. And uh, we also had this uh, question about uh, uh, sulfur and whatnot, uh, the acids and- Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, th that's true that the sulfur and also CO2 and other things that are, can be also in the gas are not so good for the health. So you can actually uh, clean them out with water. You just need to like, wash it out and only methane goes through and everything else you can use in the greenhouse for food production like the leftover water so we also care for the people's health and uh, methane uh, if methane pure methane burns it's only water and co2 that's uh, happening chemically so it's uh, safe and uh, that could also be transferred to greenhouse for the plant uh, growth so we try to be as circular and uh, human and eco-friendly as possible. The purification process needs some extra energy. So we're looking into how much extra energy you need to put. And one important thing from our side as well is that many uh, biogas reactors today have this problem that uh, different uh, pathogens like salmonella or some uh, stomach worms can uh, come through this, the compost. So we're also looking how to make it uh, safe for the health uh, and, uh, reasons. The best solution so far is composting as also seen on the picture. After the leftovers will be composted, that also yeah. produces heat up to 70 degrees and that can sustain the heat needed also for the reactor and maybe even homes. So we try to build up as much as a circular system as possible. That's it. Okay, thank you. You're pretty pretty well in time. Uh, I have first question. If anybody wants to ask the second one, please raise your hand already. Uh, the first question is uh, uh, the is kind of environmental impact necessary to create this system. Have you cal calculated this also? Because there is going to be some kind of uh, some kind of in infrastructure, basically. Uh, I understand that this is by far not uh, not in the same scale, for example, like the big lithium ion uh, accumulators in, in the electric vehicles, but still there is some. So, do you know, is it substantial and how quickly are you going to offsetting this in, in the real operation? So, yes, uh, since we are still uh, considering different materials, what to use, we don't have exact uh, answers the moment, but we are looking into um, hempcrete, which we actually heard we can get uh, in Estonia. Hempcrete is something that is also uh, putting CO2 together. And very well insulating. And it's insulating as well. So and it's durable. One thing, of course, is for it to be durable, so it can last for hundreds of years, so the offset will happen. And yeah, if it's natural materials used mostly, then it should be also okay. Yeah, so we're actually would be a customer of the infrastructure already there in Estonia. Okay. Uh, 
usually these uh, this kind of methane productions uh, today built built uh, near the farms where there is a lot of suitable waste to be processed. Uh, do you know what is the price of the methane produced there? And if you are going to produce it in significantly smaller scale, what is the potential price of your methane compared to that? Uh, the price uh, in Coxvere uh, is below one euro now. Uh, kilogram or what? Uh, yeah, for kilogram. And that's actually like a lot of gas. <laughs> so it's pretty cheap. Um, uh, yeah, but the benefit of this is that actually the transport costs get lower, like you you don't have to bring the biomass there, like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what's, uh, what's the kilogram price going to be in your solution? Uh, is it competitive? Does it make sense to do it in such a small scale? This is something we have to find out. Uh, these calculations are uh, ongoing at the moment, let's say. Okay. This is uh, this is a trick with the green uh, green startups that uh, it has to be economically sustainable also meaning that uh, it does have to make economic sense. If it's going to be too expensive, nobody is going to buy uh, buy this. Uh, uh, you might use it, this solution, and few more enthusiasts might use this solution, but it's not going to be a widespread uh, solution then means that it's not going to have a big influence across the world but uh, like i think it's not only the gas that's happening it's also about biodiversity and local systems uh, it's not only like i get the energy it's also waste management uh, you can actually grow instead of lawns uh, you can uh, like on the picture you can see the flowers and like the meadow and all the biomass you can create the environment to produce more biomass and it's good for the biodiversity also and you can produce food it's nutrient cycle local you don't want to give away your precious nutrients okay how does it how is it connected to biodiversity uh yeah it's um one part of the company it's my uh, master's thesis uh, how to use landscape to produce more biomass uh, using biogas uh, uh, fertilizer and like everything so to create the system in a way that it's uh, also considering biodiversity and and promoting it yeah i understand this is important password but is it important part of your business model or value proposition also here uh, i don't see the direct very direct link here here you can do some side activities, of course, to, to support the biodiversity and, and uh, I don't know, rewilding re the monocrop, foreign monocrop plants and or whatever you're doing there. But it's not kind of very clearly visible direct link, I, I think. But yes, last comment, if you want to give. Yeah. yeah. We're in the beginning and now we're like focusing on the biogas because that's one element that's like sensor and like the engine. But in the end, we would like to provide the fully permacultural holistic systems where the rainwater is used, uh, like all, all the innovation you can use is there, uh, like greenhouses, solar panels, see through. Okay. You know, I don't say I don't say it's a bad idea. I'm sorry I'm interrupting you because we have short short time. I understand your point. Uh, what I am a little bit be cautious about uh, putting too many features into one value proposition because all these features need additional investment, additional development, but value proposition, the outcome of the money is still one. Ideally, uh, you should aim for something else that you have one element which you can sell to different customers for different purposes so with one investment you get mo many monies so to say but in your case what you're telling me right now you invest in a lot of different elements and sell them as a as a one product so yeah we can we can discuss it on in, in mentorship a bit bit longer but we need to move on now so uh, another one who sent me, well, I'm looking for the name, um, Maria Goravoska, are you here? If not, then the first one who raises the hand gets, gets to talk next. 
Okay, go ahead, Martin. You were the first, I think. Uh, yes, I'll start sharing the screen. Maybe a quick question, if I may, in the meantime. In sure. the... Yes. I I did not receive your email, so I I don't have any slides. Can I go later, just by word? Yeah, Maybe. actually, only only a couple of teams sent their slides, so you can go after Martin then. Okay, thanks. So can I start? Yes, please. So hello everyone. I'm Martin from Bat Cycle, and we deal with repurposing retired lithium-ion battery packs and recycling the end-of-life lithium-ion battery cells to recover the valuable battery materials. So I'll get straight to the point. Our positive environmental impacts are that we reduce the amount of environmentally harmful waste, reduce the carbon footprint of lithium-ion batteries, we prolong battery life and provide cheaper energy storage uh, options. The negative impacts of the recycling process is uh, high energy consumption and high chemical consumption. And we also create a lot of uh, chemical waste that needs to be uh, utilized and uh, and disposed of accordingly. With second life batteries, there is a high ri risk of failure, and we also uh, uh, create new batteries that need to be recollected for them not to become uh, hazardous waste. Uh, what are we trying to prevent and improve? We try to re reduce the environmental impact of uh, lithium ion batteries, and we try to improve the efficiency and recovery of all major battery materials. Oh, sorry. Uh, prolonged battery life, material circularity, and battery sustainability. So state of the art in the industry is uh, normally uh, pyrometallurgy, hydrometallurgy, or a combination of both. Uh, only valuable materials are mostly targeted, and other materials are either downcycled or not recycled at all. Graphite, for example, is normally burned as fuel, and lithium is recovered as the last step. And uh, because of this, uh, it results in low uh, recycling efficiencies. So how we would differ from uh, competition is we would uh, offer both second life and recycling solutions, uh, depending on the state of health of, of the battery. Uh, we will recycle all major battery materials that includes metals from the cathode, current collectors, graphite and casing materials, and we would also uh, valor, uh, valorize uh, of spent, uh, spent graphite uh, for new applications. Here you can see some images of uh, cobalt sulfide, lithium carbonate, and uh, current collectors. So monitoring and regulation. Uh, monitoring is done on a governmental level, uh, mostly by environmental services, and we are strongly dependent of uh, various regulations mostly waste management regulations and the European Commission battery directive. Uh, public understanding is generally very low, especially with recycling, but uh, in business it is very high due to very high investments and uh, urgency of the problem. And uh, an example of greenwashing, I would uh, say is uh, normally recycle, say they recycle, for example, 70 or 80 percent of uh, materials but uh, uh, that is just the recycling by mass and they don't actually say how much of materials they've uh, really recycled, like recovered uh, to be used again in uh, batteries. So that should be it. Uh, I think three minutes is up. Thank so you. Questions. Thank you. Um, as you are a specialist in this field, I have one personal interest uh, question. Uh, I've heard for some time that in future the bioleaching more and more environmentally friendly bioleaching technologies are going to be used in uh, processing this kind of waste not only the batteries but similar electronic waste how far is this right now Do you know? uh, it's not very far because uh, it is very uh, expensive uh, to cultivate uh, the bacteria and you also need to control uh, the system very well for the bacteria to not die and it's uh, very slow uh, right now so the uh, capacity remains uh, very slow for the recycling process and it's not yet ready uh, at all for uh, the industry i would say maybe in like five or ten years it might be viable but not now okay thank you does anybody else have questions and comments i don't want to be the only one who is talking here so please 
it's the opportunity to do exchange ideas and just give feedback. It's not that you have to be, you have to provide some kind of really deep insight here. In the apologies, uh, sorry. Please, Harold. Yeah, uh, I really, really like this idea. It's very, very in, like important thing. But I think the bacterial uh, valorization is happening in Estonia now. They're making a factory in Eastern Estonia. Oh, okay. Yeah, which, so, which factory? Uh, it should be Biotatic. Uh, but I haven't checked. I just uh, heard uh, uh, news about it, that they're making uh, a factory. But I think you're re referring to the nickel metal hydride factory yeah they're like uh, mostly doing like electronical waste not like battery waste but yeah, yeah. Um, to the uh, well. yeah that's a little bit different and uh, right now we have talked with the waste management companies who deal with uh, lithium ion batteries in Estonia and right now all of the waste uh, is collected in all of the Baltic states and then sent to Poland for recycling because that's the nearest recycler that uh, they have and they have to send them and just pay them to get rid of the batteries. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one question also. Uh, is it also to recycle the electronic cigarette, like the vape uh, batteries? Because it's a really huge problem right now. There is nothing. Uh, it depends uh, what batteries they use. We normally deal with uh, rechargeable lithium ion batteries. Uh, the process can be built that you can recycle a wider uh, variety of materials, but then other problems can come up uh, that you don't have enough uh, material purity, the recycling process gets very complex and so forth. Good. So I'm monitoring the chat also. What do you want to have a question? Sorry, I'm just a little bit new to Zoom. There's so many platforms now. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I just uh, kind of don't really understand the model itself. It's just recycling of uh, used batteries and try to provide some kind of new life. Is that the base idea? Uh, well, basically, we uh, take battery cells and uh, we mm -hmm. test their state of life. If uh, they are healthy, then mm -hmm. we uh, repackage them into new batteries and then we uh, sell them as second life batteries. And they are much cheaper and they have to be for them to be a viable option because they have a smaller uh, shelf life and smaller capacity. And with uh, batteries that are not uh, viable, then we uh, uh, dismantle and recycle them and uh, we extract the, the uh, valuable materials from them and this is uh, very profitable because for example lithium and cobalt prices are uh, like tens of thousands of dollars per uh, ton uh, so what we've done calculations so on average per uh, ton of battery you get about uh, 15,000 uh, uh, euros of uh, profit okay. uh -huh. I see. So I'm dropping a comment. Read them, please. And if uh, there are no questions about Martin, last comment is that uh, in your case also, I know that there are some recycling happening in the world. You mentioned yourself, the Poland, uh, yeah. probably to be successfully raising funding from the investors, you have to emphasize what's your advantage going to be compared to the state of the art in, yeah. in the world right now. And hopefully it's going to be some kind of uh, new tweak to the technology. Yeah, well, it, then we then I would have to get very technical, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. So thank you for your time. And uh, Joseph. Uh, yes, sure. Let me... Uh, I made a couple of slides in the meantime. <laughs> No, I I already had one. Just kidding. But I'm. I was Martin, can you unshare? Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, let's see. Yeah, now you should be able to see the screen, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, yeah, it will be a little bit rough since I'm not very well prepared. But okay. So basically, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Joseph from Cool Arctic, and we basically we help to dramatically reduce 
black ship ships black carbon emissions while actually generating up to half a million US dollars per ship annually. Uh, a little bit about the problem. Black carbon. So a lot of people about know about carbon dioxide, methane, etc., gases. A black carbon is actually not gas, it's a solid particle, but it has a very, it's actually a second largest contributor to human caused climate change. So it's a very, very significant player, but it's solid particles. You can see it on the picture. It's basically all this kind of black sort of dust which comes out from, uh, and it happens due to incomplete burning of fuel. And shipping industry is one of the major contributor to black carbon emissions. And uh, basically we wanna help uh, and it's, it causes a lot of issues, especially in the Arctic region with accelerated ice melting, etc. So what we wanna do is actually, uh, we want to help solve the solution. Uh, so solve this problem by actually filter, filtering out black carbon particles. And the approach we are considering is what's called wet electrostatic participation. Uh, sorry, precipitation. I'm uh, not participation. And uh, the, the offer to the industry is that basically we provide kind of a package of a filter setup and maintenance. We link them to the carbon market platform so that, you know, by installation, uh, they actually can generate directly the revenue for themselves. And then we would, we think also to provide some, you know, uh, some sensors to actually monitor the performance of the filters. And so they have real time insights into their performance. And the idea is to focus especially on the Arctic region with where the impact from black carbon is the largest and most severe. And then once we, and then go global from there. And when talking about the Arctic region, we are focusing on the cruise and cargo ships, which are the largest kind of players, players there. And with this approach, we think we can reduce black carbon emissions from shipping by over 90%. And it's already like been proven with this VESP technology on, on the market. Uh, it's my second and uh, last slide. So basically in terms of environmental impact. So actually our, if we talk about like article eight and article nine, we think we belong to article nine because actually our primary driver is impact. So we want to help, you know, reduce black carbon emissions, which is a very severe climate impact. And we can also, we think with, by installing these filters on ships, we might help to filter out also other pollutants from the ship exhaust. For example, also additionally, some other greenhouse gases, which is, you know, again, would be a positive uh, impact for the climate. Um, also, we, we might do, as, as I mentioned, sensor installation, which could drive more optimal fuel usage. That's another positive impact. And the uh, last point here, which is, which could be actually, I put it in both categories that, Maybe because of uh, our filters, you know, ship owners might be able to use a bit dirtier oil, and uh, but filter out the emissions. But it's it's uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, arguable point. And in terms of downsides on environmental impact, so with this filter we collect black carbon. So we need to understand what's actually done with this black carbon after we collect it. So there are two possibilities: either we burn it and uh, you know, transform it from black carbon to carbon dioxide. Well, still we end up with carbon dioxide, but uh, what's called global warming potential of carbon dioxide is 1500 times less than of black carbon. So it's actually, you know, we go in terms of in environmental impact, we go way down, but it's still, there is, or there is another option we can collect it and uh, see how we can uh, deal with it later. Um, this, uh, Electrostatic precipitation units, they consume quite some energy. So it's estimated, yeah, quite some energy. So yeah, we need uh, to understand how it's uh, kind of been, uh, so how we can make it more green. And yeah, what I mentioned about the ships that uh, there might be a possibility for ships to keep running with more dirty oil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I know this is not really seasoned idea you you just presented this on the on the hackathon a couple of weeks ago i i'm happy to see that you have found out the uh, found the technology to match with the idea uh, but you mentioned that it increases the fuel consumption uh, is this additionally burned fuel fuel you are not uh, creating more ghg gases than you're capturing i hope 
Um, I didn't mention here that it increases fuel consumption. Uh, did did you? I mentioned here actually that we might actually have it requires more... energy. You said, but ah, uh, this um, is the fuel consumption, right? Ah, okay, okay, okay. No, true, true. Uh, yeah, this is we are talking here more about like onboard energy, so which is basically electricity. Yeah, power. I mean, yes. yeah, but it's, it came, comes from the same place. That's true. That's true. That's a good point. So we need to make some calculations here how to understand it better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Point. Cool. Uh, anybody else have a questions? I don't Those... have a question, but I have a proposal for yes. what you can do with black carbon. Yes, please. It's a little bit funny because um, it might be a gimmick, but I used to live in Beijing for a few years and pollution there is really quite horrendous like especially in the winter a lot of people would still use coal to heat up their houses or businesses so some days you'll come out and you won't see the house across the street because it would be so smoggy uh, so there was one company that was collecting that black carbon and turning it into some kind of jewelry and there's even a rumor that you can turn it into diamonds okay. so uh just something to put on the table <laughs> yeah no interesting idea thanks thanks it's a cool idea yeah the problem with creating the artificial diamonds is that this is also quite energy, yeah, high yeah. energy consumption, consumption. So yeah, but interesting idea, definitely. Yeah. So, please, next question. So uh, this is maybe a little bit off topic, but it's kind of on topic also for uh, lowering the maritime. Uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, have you looked into the technology of uh, rotor sails? It's something I found out quite recently. It's again old technology, but it's coming to the new age. You mean like this kind of kite sails which are attached to a ship? It's a big uh, cylinder. Okay. Ah, okay. 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 Uh, like, yeah, um, I. Mean, I've... I've seen like some projects in that direction. To be honest, it's a little bit out of our scope, but it's definitely like very interesting initiatives out there to make it more green. Sure. I have a question to specify the meaning. Uh, like, do you think in the future there will be carbon burned on the ship still, or there will be renewable energies and uh, ships will be on wind power? Maybe their carbon era is over. Yeah. I don't think it will be on wind because it's well. I'm a, I'm a, I'm. I like to say I'm a sailor myself, and you don't want to be dependent on wind like with your cargo. <laughs> it's very unpredictable. But like for example, one of the largest companies in this industry is Maersk, and what they're doing, they're looking into this. You know what's called uh, you know green fuels, and in particular like methanol. Which is like way kind of more clean than what's currently being used. So it's well, methanol of course contains carbon still, but it's way uh, cleaner what's currently being used. And they are also looking into ammonia. Ammonia doesn't contain any obviously any carbon, and uh, so it could be an, also an option. So that's basically for them. That's two major alternatives they are heavily investing into right now. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions, comments? I have maybe myself one comment. So just like a fresh idea from uh, from today's uh, mentor session, is that like by uh, there is some regulation already, obviously in the maritime industry. So they quite some ships they already use some what's called scrubbers. It's kind of filter, but especially aimed at uh, sulfur uh, sulfur content. So we are yeah we are starting to think maybe you know if you can kind of combine it with already used technology, you know, and somehow upgraded, then, you know, it would be way more easy to implement it, you know, rather than installing. Because I just today actually uh, seen a picture of a scrubber and it's like, it's like a truck size. It's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I understand the scrubber technology. It, it's used in, in other applications also. It's pretty low tech stuff usually. But uh, one of the things with the scrubbers, scrubbers is that you have to periodically replace the content, the active material, which is uh, binding the pollutants there. 
Okay. So okay. this is also additional cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not intimately familiar with this technology, but but if somebody ha has, then they can comment here also. Or I can you have another comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, could you confirm if uh, ammonia has, uh, as I know, ammonia has some uh, pollution, but compared to nitrogen, what is more ecological, nitrogen or ammonia? Uh, you mean as a fuel for ships? Yeah. I'm not sure if you can use nitrogen as a fuel for ships. That's... Okay, but is there any pollution from ammonia? Could be, to be honest, I, I have no idea. I'm not a specialist on ammonia, so I mean, okay. how I know, I think they make it from, well, from nitrogen and hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So I guess yeah. it depends on the cleanness of the original, you know, well, they get nitrogen from air and hydrogen they probably get from uh, electricity. Natural gas, probably. Yeah, so I guess it depends on the purity of original, yeah, natural gas. Okay, I just remember from somewhere that there is some to toxins in ammonia. Just <laughs> okay, thank you for clarification. Ammonia as a chemical, it's NH3. It's it's yeah, it's pretty specific and not very edible <laughs> or breathable thing. You should probably be in very tight contact with that, but yeah, we have a chemist actually in, in the group, so if somebody wants to comment. Yeah. yeah. And if not, then yes, please. No, I just want to mention that actually just today I discovered also from one mentor that speaking about the scrubbers, that there is even an Estonian company that makes these scrubbers, Estone Arc or Estark. Okay. So, uh, cool. But uh, but for what purpose? As I understand, the scrubber itself is it just a name of technology. You can use it for various purposes or they produce it for various purposes. Yeah, so what I know, at least what I know how they use it for the maritime industry. So they filter out, you know, this uh, sulfur oxide emissions mm -hmm. and because, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's the main purpose. Yeah, there are also CO2 scrubbers actually, which are used in submarines. Okay, okay. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Uh, for Gwen B, please. Hi, hi. Try to share. Yes. Share, share, share. Swipe or share. Share, share, share. Swipe on screen. Right now. So, so can you see me? Uh, in slides. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm going this for Queen B and uh, device inside the hives that allows uh, uh, beekeepers uh, predict uh, what happening uh, with the bee colonies in bee hives. So the problem is that uh, every year uh, till one uh, and thirty percent uh, bee colonies are dying and uh, the reasons why are they dying are several but uh, what we hope to uh, help beekeeper uh, to reduce this uh, colony uh, collapse each year and uh, um, the positive uh, impacts would be that uh, would help with this device, they could um, plan uh, apiary visits. Uh, so they reduce um, those costs, uh, uh, those costs uh, for fuel and time for labor costs. And uh, uh, there is uh, hope uh, to help uh, save uh, each year one till three percent of bee colonies uh, with those sensors and uh, yeah and uh, when 
beekeepers uh, could track rapid nectar flow. Uh, they could yield uh, more productive um, uh, honey yields. So more productive uh, they could be. Yes, uh, the, the negative side is um, that it's uh, sensors that requires the batteries and those uh, materials like PCB and integrated chips and uh, other passive and active components, uh, they are hard to recycle. Yes, and it needs energy to um, send uh, data from uh, beehive to uh, beekeepers app. Yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, okay. uh, this is not so much about the environmental impact, but over the about the general the idea there are quite few smart bee hive solutions with the small twists maybe what is the bigger biggest differentiator for you yeah, yeah. so for now uh, in order to uh, track swarming state uh, or uh, event of uh, uh, rapid nectar flow. Uh, right now, usually beekeepers use hive scales. Um, we planning uh, track it by audio classification. Microphone inside the uh, beehive uh, will listen how bees are buzzing, and it allows us to hear. Uh, swarming mood uh, one till two days before event. Okay, and this audio processing others are not using today, right? Uh, please say again. This audio processing, audio signal processing, other uh, competitors are not using today. Um, no, there are few competitors that uh, using audio classification as well. But uh, majority of them are using um, uh, typical fast Fourier transformations that um, usually, uh, how you say, uh, their predictions are not so precise. And uh, they really often send wrong message to beekeeper. Okay. Uh, I know that there is a I'm talking about the environmental impact, this uh, uh, beehive death syndrome, or however it is called. Uh, I understand that this is somewhat a mystery yet, but uh, there is no clear answer why it happens. Uh, one of the one of the ways how to investigate such uh, such uh, mysteries is usually to collect all kind of data, and if this happens, then uh, try to find uh, some kind of pattern. Are you mm. also able to participate in this kind of search and, and collect the data and maybe maybe yes yes and uh, there there is existing com competition that the business model is just like that help to gather those data for scientific uh, uh, aims okay yes but but uh, when you talk with beekeepers they precisely know what happened there. They, they tell that there is no mystery. There is uh, varomite, there is uh, not enough food, and there is this climate change when uh, bees are not wintering well. They, they produce new bees. Oh, it's, it's, it's too long, sorry. Uh, but for beekeepers, they usually know what happened, why bee colonies collapse. They just need to see how beehive looks. 
Okay. Okay. Now, colony collapse uh, syndrome is this thing. Or yeah. colony collapse disorder. I yeah. just just a couple of months ago, I read an article who, which claimed that uh, there is no clear answer yet why it happens. But if you say that it's known, actually, then okay. Yeah, when when you talk with beekeepers and ask, do you know why your bees each year one to thirty percent die? They say they know exactly why, but uh, uh, they did what they can, and and even then they do not survive. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, let's move on with the questions. Uh, anybody? If not, then I will come back to that. Oh, sorry, Vadim, you raised the hand. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I was just uh, wondering if you can shortly explain what is the thing that makes your thing stand out? just in a short uh, explanation because yeah. i didn't understand was it because uh, they use a specific yeah. low type of frequency analyzing for the bees and you use like a bit more smarter system was that it yeah um for now uh, in on the market uh, there are no uh, solutions like all uh, we are uh, using uh, how you say uh, microcontroller that records audio and then uh, compare it uh, with help of algorithm and then uh, they uh, send uh, through LoRa network uh, just uh, this um, just this conclusion and uh, there is nothing uh, unique about this electronic uh, solution. Uh, that unique is that algorithm, uh, that data which uh, algorithm con consists. So uh, who earlier will start gathering uh, data, their data pool will be bigger so the algorithm will be more precise. So, so that's all advantage I can think of right now. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. So uh, last comment, it's not so much a question, but a comment, I believe I, I said it uh, on this uh, starting day also, which we had in, in restaurant, that as I understand, there is this uh, city beekeepers who have a trouble accessing occasionally their uh, beehives if they are put in two exotic locations. And this kind of uh, long distance monitoring is good. And if you combi combine this uh, with the emphasis on biodiversity, which is emerging now in the cities in Tallinn also, you know, this Putuka Vailad and, 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 sorry, I don't know how it is in English. Basically, uh, the cultured, nurtured parks with the big lawns, lawns, grass, monocultural stuff. This is kind of falling out of fashion slowly. And then uh, biodiversity is coming back to cities and the bees are essential from that point of view. So if, yeah. you, if you partner with your solution with this kind of message and biodiversity, uh, biodiversity impact, then this, I think, might be a powerful marketing tool for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we really we really think about the business model where uh, large companies adapt beehives from beekeepers and uh, our data is their marketing tool to show how big impact they are doing. So, but it's just testing phase right now. Okay, cool. We have to move on. Uh, we have five more companies uh, waiting. We can take one more in the queue if, if somebody wants to put uh, themselves up there. And right now, Tobu, please, the floor is yours. So, hello to everyone. Hello. Uh, our pitching visual Rasmus will give a quick overview of our idea and we'll show you the slides now. 
Yeah. So Ibrahim, you raised the hand. Uh, did you want to ask anything? Sorry, I interrupted you. So, oh, no, I, I wanted to pitch also. Sorry, then I okay, forgot. Uh, check out the hand. comment section. We we are forming queue in the comment oh, section. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See. Uh, oh, wait. Sorry, we're trying to uh, share the screen. Just one moment to show the. I uh, may not quit the room. Uh, well, uh, I leave meeting. I think we have to. Uh, maybe someone else can uh, pitch before us. We'll try to uh, like share the screen properly. It's hey, Pankery, like, then you yeah, Pankery will be after them. Sure. Okay, I will try to uh, share my screen. Uh, sorry, this is not the right one, but this one visible. Good. Go ahead. Good. Okay. Now we are looking on SEG uh, 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 from a little bit different angle because we are um, fintech. And uh, initially, our idea was not built uh, so that considering that we are kind of uh, SEG or environmentally important also. But a few time ago, I saw uh, that Microsoft president was talking in, uh, in CNBC about their ESG strategy. And it was surprised to me that uh, this kind of tech company is uh, turning so much attention. It. So very briefly, when Microsoft customers use their cloud services, the companies do not have to maintain their own personal server parks, uh, and which, you know, they reduce the cost and the environment uh, impact for them. So, and that was the, exactly the case where we found out that our uh, solution is also can be some, we, we have another value proposition. So very briefly about our, uh, our, our model. So Banker is FinTech and we are targeting loan customers. For example, in Estonia, there are 10 banks. And if you want to apply a loan, it's quite easy. Uh, you choose some of them. But in Poland, for example, there are 200 banks. And in total, in Europe, there are 4,500 banks. You know. So and one day, when you want to apply the loan, which bank do you choose? So we did a survey in spring. And we found uh, among uh, 30 uh, participants, and 90% they said that uh, if they take loan, they take loan from their bank where they, they, they have this bank card or they are banking. And the other option is to choose the best known one in Estonia, for, for example, Swedbank, SCB Bank, LH3, right? And then we ask, what is your struggle? How do you feel? Why don't you get offers from other banks? And then we found out that it's such a difficult process. You talk so many people, you fill every separate application, every separate web, uh, web page in the banks that are different conditions, etc. So it's a huge problem. So we found out that we must come to the market. So our solution is that if you go to the banker website or another uh, solution from our partner website, then you fill only one application, only one. Then you select the banks where you want to send the application and you just one click of a button, the banks receive the application from directly to the, uh, to the servers via API. So we're consolidating the marker and future the bankery have uh, the vision is to be one layer that uh, reduces the hustle, hustle between the loan applicants and the banks. This is a difficult model, but that's that's the issue. And um, now our environmental um, impact is exactly that uh, we would like the banks to see oh, what, what is our problem. Problem is that we found that uh, 
uh, we asked all the banks. The banks are not so ready to join us to take loan ac applications from our uh, system because banks prefer that uh, loan applicants turn to them. But we found out that uh, if we could uh, offer one value for banks, and as far as we know, the banks need to also start being SEG or start to you know, develop their you know, environmental uh, important uh, you know, requirements that are coming. So our you know, solution is also one value that if they join us, then uh, they can reduce their footprint exactly the same way as Microsoft does. So uh, only one, one point entry and even going farther that they can even outsource the loan process from us in future. So we are, you know, we, we are moving towards a platform model when we can make the pre-scoring, we download documents and do everything uh, instead that every bank, bank has to do by themselves, we do it for them. So, um, so what we are looking in a, in a prototype is uh, rather mentorship and how we would be able to develop some measurements, uh, how to measure the impact and how to sell for the banks. Our, you know, this footprint, what, what would be this, uh, I don't know, numbers that how much we can increase the efficiency and these numbers. So that's the that's the that's the case here. I don't show this lot of yeah. uh, answer you that just, I wrote. Thank you. You just used twice the amount of time which we served oh, for right. this application. Sorry. If I were if I were to summarize uh, what you just tell told us, uh, as there are this kind of insurance brokers like easy easy .de, you are basically easy .de in banking. Your banking broker in that sense is it correct. Uh, 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 yes and no. We are trying to avoid uh, to be uh, loan agents agents because these are uh, direct comp competitors. We would like to be a SaaS company that we are offering the solution, and we 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 very very well know how these agents and uh, brokers are working. That's so a technical they, technical yes. differentiation. But but and functionally, the, the it seems idea, to me. That that you are saying? The function overall is the same, but we are focusing on the consumer and reducing the hustle of the banks and the consumer from the both sides. If you integrated that uh, with uh, finding the best environmental impact also, the because, well, you have on one way, you you if you own, if you are between the banks and the customers, then you own the customer's environmental data also. And uh, if if oh. the banks uh, banks ask you to please assemble me a customer portfolio, this and that kind of impact, then uh, then yeah you can do it probably and ask ask better value better return from the banks also. I, I guess it's possible. So there are there are a lot of opportunities way, this if is, you do it properly. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is quite a good idea because we have the data yeah, and uh, we can sell it also. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, this this data, the environmental impact data, this is becoming valuable for the banks in very near future if it isn't yet. But we have a couple of questions now, Joseph, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Induk. Yeah, thanks, Imer. Very interesting uh, project. Uh, maybe first kind of point. One of the mentors is called Mikkel Tam, so you should definitely yeah. talk to him because he's an ESG guy at uh, Stepbank. I mentioned uh, him before already. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, he is, he is. It's correct. And if he's mentor here, then all the better. I didn't know that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, good recommendation. Yeah, just for my thinking. I mean, so you're talking about you were talking about the bank's own foot carbon footprint, right? Yeah. No. Yeah, it's a footprint uh, overall mm -hmm. of like basically IT operations, so to speak. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is it like I would try to basically evaluate how large it is, you know, how much you can actually save, you know, because if you use it on your own server or on their server, is it really like a big impact, you know, or not? 
Yeah, exactly. This is what we have to come up with, that uh, we have no idea that we can offer this kind of value, but we have to, you know, make this kind of uh, measurements and, uh, you know, yeah, the numbers okay. and uh, formulas. Yeah, this is this is what we are developing at the moment also. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sorry, we have thank, one thank more you. question from Martin. Uh, you are muted, Martin. I have a similar question that like, how are you actually lowering the uh, environmental impact by uh, using third party like uh, providers? Because for me, it just seems that you dump the responsibility on another company and then you just show better results for yourself. So it's for me, I don't see how you actually like uh, benefit in the bigger picture, like for mm -hmm. the environment. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. We try to try to find find it out also, because okay. somehow Microsoft is selling similar uh, similar uh, concept. Yeah, okay. but uh, like to me, it just seems like like on paper you can uh, say you're more environmentally friendly, but like actually you're not. So it's just like also with recycling, you can bypass laws like this. So yeah, in in banking, basically it is on the paper. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Guys, sorry, we have to move on. Yeah, uh, thank you. Tobu, are you ready now? Yeah, we are ready now and we'll uh, share the screen. Yes. Share. I hope everyone can see it. Good. Okay, Perfect. very good. So uh, we are Tobu, I am Rasmus, uh, this is Seem, and we are building your home inside a, a phone, or home inside your phone, basically. Uh, I will give a short overview of our product and then I will talk about the environment. So basically, the problems that uh, we are solving, uh, there are uh, three things. So currently, your home uh, technical pass, or in Estonia, your home's omaniku uh, kasutusjuhend, uh, it is usually on paper, or in a good case, they are like PDF files in uh, different folders that are quite hard to access. So the first problem with that is it is very time consuming to put together uh, the technical pass since it's uh, done by the constructor and it's done manually. So it is very time consuming and uh, wastes a lot of man hours. Then secondly, the real estate developers who give the technical pass to the homeowner, they get the bombarded with a lot of questions when they give over the keys since uh, homeowners are confused which also brings us to the third problem is that homeowners do not know how to maintain their home properly since they don't do not have a clear overview of all the parts and they do not also understand all the maintenance uh, times and guarantees uh, and uh, the, making this uh, problem more en environmental is that uh, homeowners uh, do not know how to maintain uh, to like maintenance on their home properly which means that the homes last less and they are not uh, like uh, too sustainable in the long term. And our solution is basically if the home is modeled in BIM, which is a software to model homes, then we can actually download most of the data from there and already make it into a technical pass uh, that is digital. So we cut the paper uh, that is the web platform part. And then we take all the like data. So the reminders and guarantees we, we like uh, show them to the uh, homeowner uh, which basically means that uh, the homeowner knows when they should maintain something in, in the end this means their house or apartment will last longer which is uh, like better since they do not have to like uh, buy a new one basically uh, in the long term like all the small maintenance you do is like very big in the long term and also uh, we are connected with different vendors that you can order the right part or service uh, through us so this is our like solution or like a demo uh, version and basically as you can see down here that um, if needed you can order a part or a service or same thing here and uh, also another environmental part would be that uh, you can uh, we, will we give uh, the customer choices uh, of like what parts to order but we will show them like the energy efficiency and this is more green and so on but currently like the bigger problem is that um, you don't uh, really like have an option since you just like see the product code go to the local like store and then you buy like the 
cheapest or you just like have only one option which is like usually not the best for the environment but uh, we like uh, are uh, like uh, in the future connected with like multiple partners and then we like uh, give the customer a clear overview that hey this is like better for the environment more sustainable and so on but this is basically a quick overview of double okay cool uh, correct me What's the difference between your solution and PIM? Because I understood that the PIM basically is the digital model of the of the building and everything it contains. Well, BIM is basically uh, well in that sense you're correct, but the BIM is for like projecting the model or like projecting the home, and that this is for like the whole building, so the whole like property. But uh, like our first clients would be flats. Which means that the, the homeowner cannot see their like individual flats and have like reminders and stuff about them. And also, you need like a special software that which costs more than a, like thousand euros to like access BIM. Yeah, the Autodesk is the one most is used, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you, if you split the whole building into the actual units uh, which which your customers are purchasing, then yeah, it actually makes sense. Oh, very good. Good. Uh, what are the impact points, environmental impact points? Uh, as I understand, you are not inter uh, going into this uh, smart building management market, so you're not providing any energy savings or anything from from there. Uh, currently, yes, like uh, there are no like energy saving uh, in that sense, but we do uh, like um, when you order a new part, then we do like uh, uh, like basically like uh, like show the between the choices, like oh, what's the energy like efficiency between this like light bulb or this one, if uh, there is like a possibility. So we like uh, make it like more transparent and like clear for the homeowner. Okay, do you think this is uh, something that? pops up uh, quite often so they have actual use to use for this uh, functionality uh, yeah there are like many things that need to be changed for example as you can see here you should uh, if you're like home as a ventilation okay. system yeah. then the average thing is around six months you should change your filter and like uh, with all the small parts it's uh, basically not the monthly thing but very often you have to change stuff so uh, in the considering a lifespan of a home it's very big impact okay. and cool so questions from the crowd please three two one okay no question okay somebody made a noise please ask a question or not okay thank you and uh, next company please uh, scrap app yeah. Good evening to everyone. Hello. Very nice, cool ideas. Uh, try to be very short and quick to hear others as well, who is in line at the moment. Oh, oh try to share. Uh, I have several monitors uh, sitting in profile, but uh, you see this uh, one, yes. one slide presentation? Yes. Uh, so we have... Uh, idea of uh, creating a platform that uh, uh, physical persons or legal persons could use uh, when they have a question or problem where to send their uh, waste or scrap through uh, recycling. And uh, first of all, we we're thinking about metal scrap to get like a aggregator prices platform that you can compare where is more close or uh, where is the best prices to deliver or uh, make uh, some kind of uh, procurements to upload your photos or some description of uh, goods that you have to uh, get uh, offers from uh, those players that are connected to the system. And uh, until Friday, we have a lot of work to understand our business model and what is uh, good or not so good. And uh, currently, I see that it has to be like wider with uh, not not the household scrap like I all may admit, but uh, for example, uh, furniture. Of, uh, I know in uh, Amsterdam you can throw your old bicycle into the river and then collect them. In, in Estonia, you have old bicycle, then uh, maybe this person doesn't want to get even to get money for that. It uh, has to have more convenient wages to order 
someone to pick it up for, for free, for example, or if I'm small construction company or doing some uh, building works, uh, have some, some waste, uh, also I could have a possibility uh, not to waste my time driving somewhere, uh, loading and un unloading, uh, I could uh, easily uh, have option to order the um, best uh, option to get rid of my uh, scrap uh, and uh, according to the type of scrap there can be lots of different uh, uh, companies or uh, recyclers and uh, very big price difference so it's not uh, always best solution to uh, throw it away to some sorting stations that will charge you 90 euros per ton uh, maybe wood or uh, story foam or some paper or cardboard uh, things you can uh, actually get get much better <laughs> expenses for your goods and uh, the same for metal scrap if it's uh, one price on the website another price it is uh, that you actually can uh, bargain and get uh, maybe 30 or 40 euros per ton uh, more than uh, than is uh, offered uh, so Okay. We're we're not producing. We're not uh, discovering the green ways, but uh, we try to help help others to make world more uh, green green place. And uh, the one part was this logistics uh, solution that if we connect logistic companies also that we can plan the uh, the way of uh, picking up the scrap so we don't waste uh, so much time and fuel that uh, 100,000 persons, uh, for example, per, per year, it's uh, 100,000 times uh, someone delivers metal scrap uh, to the scrapyard and the quantity is less than uh, one ton. So it should be possible maybe to get uh, like cir circle to okay. plan, plan this be better way. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you. Questions, please. If not, I wanted to ask you a comparison. You mentioned here that there are no all-in solutions. I know that at least a couple of uh, similar startups are trying this in uh, in uh, Estonia. One is the Materli Walk, and the other is made mm -hmm. by Heike Laidma, the same guy who made the smart swap, but I can't remember right now the name of his new company. If somebody remembers, please tell it. Uh, so at least you. Uh, Kuhu Via was one website that uh, provides information where it. Uh, Via is the third one. Collecting the. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Kuhu Via is the third yes. one. But it's a like governmental. Yeah. Like a so, profit organization. The Heike Leitma is a business angel and mm -hmm. investor actually, and he did uh, initially did the smart swap, which uh, dealt. Uh, I think the biggest uh, biggest uh, one he's doing is all the houses, and for example, the the company shuts the doors, then there is a whole office full of stuff, and uh, original nor normally they would have to pay for uh, for somebody to take it away into the scrap scrap heap but uh, then the smart swap guys will take it away for free and just distribute yeah, to someone who needs it more. Sort out, yeah. yeah but this is the yeah. this is the furniture stuff but mm -hmm. uh, the same guys did this uh, leftover materials platform also which is kind of competitor to material evoke and competitor to you now my question is i know that they are all quite sm quite small still but uh, Again, the traditional question, how are you different and especially how, how are you different in terms of uh, environmental impact, which is our today's focus here? Mm, I think I maybe it's stuck in my head that uh, uh, there is no all-in solutions. Uh, I was thinking about metal scrap because uh, this okay. uh, uh, to easily compare prices uh, if I'm in, in one town or another location then i can see who is like uh, closer and what uh, the price levels and uh, and it was it would be good for me as a uh, working in a metal scrap company then uh, it would be easy to see what uh, 
competitors are uh, uh, currently offering and if any changes are made and uh, how to be more uh, ecology company uh, my, my idea was this uh, from one kind that uh, uh, logistics if to add like a phys physical business also to the online mm -hmm. solution and uh, the other part that uh, not not direct directly connected but uh, we have heard that there's some companies who are collecting uh, scrap and then uh, leaving it in, in some forest or on the field somewhere and uh, disappearing so uh, the the owner of the territory has to pay or uh, now, now they have some insurance uh, obligations but it may be also not uh, we don't okay. know currently how it's changed its situation yeah. and uh, also this uh, from metal scrap part uh, uh, in, in uh, okay we have you, two you more see questions this, uh, cool advertisements that we come and take and uh, for free or pay something and actually they don't have license and they don't have right to do actually that Good. sorry we have two more questions yeah. please Jurgen. I, I really wonder uh, how how many people would use all these apps um, because at least 50 percent of the people um, well they are like uh, behind other people because they are too young too old um, they are under medication or their psychological uh, health is not enabling uh, them, them to use uh, these services and apps. So, what is the number of the people who would use Crap App and um, other applications we heard before? That's that's my uh, question. That, that's where we have to use your service to make it more understandable <laughs> to others. <laughs> Great but, answer, uh, thank you. Uh, we don't yeah, have limitations uh, expect except if uh, you know with, with metal scrap you need to be uh, more than 16 years old I think when you have right to sign or uh, make, make uh, commitments uh, mm -hmm. but I think uh, mm, a lot of elderly we, we people have a lot of a lot of metal scrap in their yards and yeah, they... that we, we face the reality we, we measured this uh, 100,000 uh, small suppliers and actually how many of them are returning customers how many of them are uh, actually they, they know by themselves where to go and uh, get the best prices maybe it's not actually working out with, with only these things where until yeah. Friday have so very less time to overview the business model and uh, but even if it's uh, not so expensive to to do and just to have like information platform uh, will also make 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 sense okay cool thanks Harold. just as a note we were talking about different companies who were doing similar thing so uh, there is this uh, trashify on the beamline accelerator who is also doing some waste management that you uh, might... they are doing waste identification it's uh, basically image recognition software for uh, sorting uh, solutions hmm. so also one one of the ideas to, if you make a photo then use some uh, ai functionality to tell what what kind of scrap it uh, yeah yeah that's what they are doing but we thought that at the moment too too much for this uh, this thing, but I I, I wrote down the Heike Leidman, the Rashify and Matteo and what to learn okay. learn learn more what they do. Okay. It's cool. Thank Next. you. Auto source. Hi. Um, let me share the screen. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. Can you see my screen? Yes, go ahead. All right. <clears throat> so after source is a new generation of water generator. Uh, we combine innovative metallurgy with improved technology. 
so to let everyone access to clean and safe water. Uh, the prototype was designed by Filippo Dinardi uh, to produce 100 liters per hour using three kilowatts of energy. So after source can be uh, powered by uh, electrical uh, from electrical circuits as well as electromagnetic mm -hmm. generators or solar panels. So we use the innovative uh, we use the revolutionary formula that was approved by professor of physics and um, uh, it, we created the software to calculate uh, water output at any conditions at any air conditions so and we got copyrights for that software and uh, currently we work on uh, developing uh, product development to decrease electricity use till uh, one kilowatt or less so uh, the problem is that According to reports from World Health Organization, 36 countries in the world facing hard water stress, and 783 million of people have no access to clean um, drinking water that cause uh, disease and deaths among children. So our competitors use the common technology to extract um, um, moisture from the air that uh, uh, use more energy and gives less water. So market validation, um, market uh, is growing, and um, we expect the growth by two, 2030, uh, it could reach 4.56 billion. Yeah, uh, here is uh, some, um, uh, here is some uh, water generator market is mostly dominated by industrial generators. And you can see the market share by regions. Yeah, and here is um, uh, cost of water consumption for human, um, for uh, cost of water for human consumption. Um, um, here is some uh, calculations on uh, savings, uh, cost savings, uh, both on electricity and environmental cost, environmental cost. So it would compare to uh, compared to a home distilled water um, in a year um, from one uh, uh, one unit, one um, generator could produce 730,000 liters per year and uh, use um, uh, use uh, more than 30,000 kilowatts less than uh, than it would be achieved uh, by uh, using home distilled water. So, <clears throat> okay. Here is uh, he, here is some information about investment and the uh, marketing plan. Uh, so we don't have we, to go through the whole uh, whole deck. We are interested about the environmental impact mostly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Uh, where's the target market? Is it in the in the southern countries where there is a lot of sun and less water? Uh, mostly, we target industrial generators. For example, we want to produce uh, water for technical needs and uh, utilize that water, utilize okay. that back to don't make, uh, to, to don't pollute the natural waters or nature. We want to generate atmospheric water and utilize that. So our main target in, is in industry and um, by regions, uh, we target mostly uh, Asian countries, Asian and African countries. Yes, Middle Middle Asia. Mm -hmm. Okay, the the water scarcity is definitely an issue there. So um, I'm thinking right now for this kind of industrial purposes, the salt water water is often present, but you are delivering the fresh water, I guess. Yeah. Okay, um, I will let others also to ask. Uh, meanwhile, Jürgen, you had a question. You have hands up, hand up. I forgot to lower. Oh, okay. Sorry, so Rita, then. Oh, yeah, I will test as well my sound. <laughs> so uh, you are talking about distillate water because how what about health issues about drinking distillate water or it's sterilized, sterilized water because. We need a lot of minerals from uh, water every day. Uh, yeah, for industrial purpose, there's no need to mineralize it, but still it will be clean and distilled water. But for uh, uh, domestic uh, domestic use, we'll have uh, alkalized filters 
all right, to mineralize the water and make it more healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, any more questions? Uh, what what is the energy source which you plan to use there? Is it uh, solar energy, renewable energy, or any any other source? Actually, we develop we develop um, <laughs> source supply energy supply from electromagnetic generators, but of course we could use uh, ready like solar panels or just use the ordinary um, uh, or ordinary supply from uh, from the wall plugs. <laughs> Or electrical sockets. So it's really what, what really is small. electro electromagnet generator? You mean the conventional generator? Uh, no, it's portable generators that worked with uh, uh, on on magnets. They use um, super magnets to run the generators, and then it could be run from motor or some other. Magnet operator. is not a fuel. No, it's no fuel. It's green generator. That and what, uh, what is the energy source there? Uh, well, we develop that. We want the motors. Uh, it runs from motors, and usually motors are working on diesel or something else. So we okay. want to to. So to, it's a diesel generator, basically. Uh, which one? This is a diesel generator. Diesel is turning the generator around, and this produces no. uh, electricity. We want to uh, uh, develop. Uh, uh, adapt or motors for uh, make like magnet motors to make this absolutely green and probably free energy source uh, for the, the magnet is not a fuel so what is the fuel there what is the energy source yeah it's a special project i could attach a, another pitch for that it's it's a specific project that i would like to develop so uh, please don't use this uh, this light then in uh, current program because this leaves an uh, impression of perpetuum mobile. Yeah, it's 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 like that. It's, it's that yeah. what I mean. Please don't do it. Please don't do it. All right. Uh, the laws of physics don't are not kind with that kind of solutions. Yeah. So if you can skip that slide, it would definitely benefit you. Okay. Good. Okay. Next project, Catsnap. So hi, it's Solvita and Linda from Catsnap. It's uh, we innovated uh, cat litter, so we care about uh, cat households because uh, cat ho households make a lot of waste, etc. So we combine to. Uh, good functionalities on already existing cat litter in market. So that it's, uh, so one is that, that you can see what you need, which part you need to change from the cat litter. And the other is that you can dispose it in wastewater, wastewater system, like uh, flushing away uh, the waste. So um, innovation is all around the composition because this is how you elimination happens. So it's naturally occurring uh, um, uh, under science. We, what uh, reacts when it's uh, due to uh, like cat uh, leftovers, waste or poops and, and peace. So yeah. So um, yes, so our innovation about this uh, all about cats because uh, but uh, households numbers has grown significantly and is still growing because of the COVID and uh, uh, that uh, that uh, people work from home more. So and about the environmental impact we try to put there. Uh, so so the positive is that uh, comparing to other cat litters, so we have uh, zero waste manufacturing. So and that it is is possible to. Uh, dispose uh, this litter in wastewater treatment systems and we if we uh, look to the wastewater treatment system systems development and the new directives so it that goes that uh, the wastewater treatment uh, uh, sludge goes to circular economy so we, this is how we uh, again uh, from uh, 
like leftovers make them uh, away, uh, possible away, like they go to sludge and uh, as the litter is made from uh, naturally occurring materials like clays and uh, natural pigments so they are beneficial for uh, a sludge component so it's not making any harm so of course so if we look to the material wise uh, again negative so clay we cannot label that it's uh, uh, renewable material. It's uh, material what we dig from the ground. Of course, we're using uh, very low um, value uh, material bentonite, which is impure, and we make it like to very valuable uh, material and selling to like uh, uh, cat owners. And uh, yeah, so um, um, this is about the material, what we can thought of. And um, uh, yes, so what we can uh, what we can add, so it's cat litter makes it significant amount of, of waste. And when it's uh, been uh, put to this uh, other disposal system, what is uh, potentially is going circular, then we can save, uh, we need to calculate how many kilograms per cat household uh, of uh, like of waste. Again, what uh, it can be calculated to like um, amount of money. So yes, uh, then um, Linda, can you join me? So are you here? Yes, uh, thank you, so uh, Yes, so apart from the product characteristics so that just described, we're also thinking about um, other ways how to stand out from our competition. Uh, so unique selling point will also involve our distribution channels, meaning that we are planning an online and a subscription-based uh, sales model, which will bypass the logistics cycle of the traditional retail stores. Uh, and according to the online information that I found, the uh, e-commerce is 17% uh, car carbon uh, efficient than a traditional retail store. Uh, that's one thing. And another aspect um, is that uh, is another uh, way of distribution through a zero waste um, uh, shops, uh, which no uh, waste, uh, which sand producers do not really use currently. And also we're, th we are thinking about the eco-friendly packaging and the uh, refill options uh, as some additional features. Uh, that is for the unique selling point. And then for public understanding, we do not really know uh, how environmentally conscious cat owners are. We assume that they care mostly about their convenience, but we are still uh, planning some, some researches to, to find out uh, more insights on that. So thank you, this is it from me. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, the first question, uh, what is circular wastewater treatment? So if we, uh, if, for example, the Riga households, they um, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, they um, leftovers when the wa water is treated and part is uh, um, like, led to the Baltic Sea. The other part is uh, is sludge. Uh, and so then sludge are used to, uh, again, the, it goes back to uh, fields, like uh, farmers are using it as fertilizer. In that way, it can be assumed as circular. Well, some of it, yes, but not to grow. Not, not at all, but, but if we look to the uh, problems and the phosphor recovery uh, needs, because it's going to end some uh, in 2050. So there's a lot of projects and on ongoing activities about uh, this uh, sludge circularity and the implementation it's in uh, far, uh, That's, in the Sorry, I'm, I'm cutting you because yeah. we are low on time. Yeah. But, uh, this is the yeah. treatment of wastewater sludge. It's completely new area, and it that doesn't have much much to do with the cat litter. But I have several yeah, more comments about that. But, <laughs> yeah. but Martin, please. Yeah, uh, you said you have uh, no waste during manufacturing or non-waste manufacturing. How do you achieve that? 
Uh, so this is uh, in terms of materials, of course, waste are uh, when uh, we use electricity, then of course it goes to some, some footprints because we need to uh, to use uh, for like to for mixing. So in that way, we have like a footprint that we need to calculate. So in uh, no waste in, uh, in material size, uh, well, no, no uh, material. Side, yeah. Okay. One stage. Uh, that's all then. If that's all, then Harold, please. So just have a note on the uh, ecological impact of cats. That uh, you said you need to check out the public uh, understanding of the uh, impact of uh, cats. And right now we can actually view cats as an invasive in species with a very unfair advantage. So all these cats who are at uh, like these country houses, they are uh, killing local small animals, plus they're being fed extra, plus they have a safe place to uh, hide from predators. So cats is uh, one very big environmental impact already to have a cat plus as a pet. Huge waste. So we are now thinking on this. Uh... Okay. Waste, so yes. But, I understood uh, that uh, yeah, in we can some make regions, from it, so <laughs> in some regions, the cats time, the favorite, like, oh. in some regions, cats are the favorite food of foxes. So, <laughs> we can, we can uh, like add foxes for the system. But yes, but if we look from this uh, depression part and human health issues, so then the cats are, our cat owners are happier person. So. Yeah. Again, if you look to humans, then very uh, egocentric uh, choices for uh, well-being. So, okay. Uh, last quick uh, comment: uh, You might check with some guy who is familiar with the in the, well municipality-sized plumbing system, because if you are regularly dumping such amounts of uh, relatively heavy heavy material into the pipes. It might have a problems there with clogging of pipes, uh, filling the sediment wells too too fast, additional energy put into the pumping stations, so on so on. Yeah, we we have expert happy about from that. we have expert from waste for trade treatment plants. Uh, they uh, he is uh, the consultant, and so we are uh, so we are. We the first insights we have that it's positive because it's clay. Uh, it's uh, particular size and um, weight and uh, but uh, there of course will be more uh, digging deeper into it so okay cool so last but not least Ibrahim floor is yours thanks Hendrik hi everyone I will share my screen with you uh, but I will not uh, I will not do a pitching. I target directly the questions of indirect in the email we received yesterday. Uh, yeah, I am Ibrahim. I have a PhD degree on tin film coatings uh, uh, for air cleaning. And uh, we found a nano wind uh, one and a half year ago for, for actually uh, to clean indoor and outdoor uh, by using our coating materials. But uh, then we did a little bit change on our business model and the technology. Then we decided to produce uh, air filters and air purifiers for outdoor air, targeting uh, nitrogen oxides and methane pollution. Uh, I will also answer the earlier question about ammonia. Ammonia is used by, uh, as a fuel and uh, product can be also nitrogen oxide, uh, which is contributing global warming and acid rains. So uh, we target, uh, as I said, um, nitrogen oxide and methane, uh, but uh, we also degradate volatile organic compounds and if we degradate volatile organic compounds and the methane actually also, uh, we receive product uh, carbon dioxide. So this is our negative environmental uh, impact. But on the other hand, positive impact is uh, we decrease uh, nitrogen oxide emissions 
and the methane and the methane is uh, greenhouse gases actually 80 times more uh, powerful at global warming than carbon dioxide uh, in last 20 year period. And uh, other question is indirect change uh, you are causing or preventing uh, through our customers. Uh, our target is uh, cities, of course, city councils and the companies who emit uh, nitrogen and methane. Uh, so uh, during their uh, processes or production in assembly lines, uh, when they uh, cause this uh, pollution, uh, we are helping them to prevent uh, their high emission of this uh, toxic gases. Uh, what is our st uh, state uh, of art in our field? Uh, we, uh, our technology is photocatalytic technology. Uh, photocatalytic technology is, um, uh, as we understand maybe from the name also, we use catal uh, catalysis, uh, catalytic materials which are uh, activated uh, with the light, with the photons. So after some uh, chemical uh, reaction chains, uh, we are uh, break down uh, this uh, nitrogen oxide and the methane uh, gases. Uh, the competition is low in this uh, field. Uh, so uh, because uh, there is a big challenge to control these uh, uh, pollutants. So, uh, but uh, our products uh, and the technology are more sustainable uh, than our competitors because uh, we use uh, sustainable carbon nanomaterials in our filters. What does it mean? Uh, we, uh, we also use uh, plastic waste uh, and uh, produce carbon nanomaterials uh, from plastic waste and we are using um, these uh, carbon nanomaterials uh, when we are uh, fabricating, let's say, our filters. Uh, and uh, our product is already uh, tested, uh, validated, uh, but uh, uh, in, in real life uh, application, it should be, it must be, of course, monitored by third party, we believe. Uh, in the future, uh, we, we need to contact with some <clears throat> universities or laboratories uh, to to monitor uh, or our uh, products, our filters. But right now uh, we we don't have those. Uh, we don't have any any contacts. Uh, in this question, I haven't understand uh, uh, actually what is a uh, forcible trends or. In what what uh, indirect mean uh, important legal norms? I will ask. Uh, I will be glad if you will explain me after my talk, so yeah. I cannot answer this. Um, but uh, public understanding is, of course, uh, maybe I'm too engineer or scientist when I start talking about uh, our technology or our products. Uh, people are sometimes getting lost. Uh, or they are thinking it's a fairy tale or something to use plastic waste to clean air. Um, but uh, customers, uh, we have two targets. Uh, one is, as I said, for our outdoor air purifiers. Uh, uh, they are cities, city councils. Uh, it is a little bit uh, hard to uh, explain them, of course, uh, what is uh, our impact or how we will do it, how it will be monitored. But it is easy to communicate with the companies uh, who emit uh, nitrogen uh, oxide or any other uh, pollutions, of course, uh, it, because uh, we are generally uh, uh, communicating with, uh, with the sales engineers or uh, directly the, the tech, uh, technology officers. So uh, after a little bit, um, uh, more details they they understand but uh, 
of course, uh, for uh, the companies or facilities, uh, is it, uh, it is a big challenge to implement our filters uh, in, uh, in their pollution source. Of course, it's, it will be always a challenge or, uh, yeah. And uh, for, uh, again, I, I didn't understand about the influence, uh, being influenced by the third party opinions or actions. Of course, we consider every, uh, every op opinion or, or uh, suggestions about our startup, if it means uh, but greenwashing uh, example. I know examples, but, um, but I will, uh, it is to my opinion or it's a uh, general it's a, public. Sorry, uh, I'm, I'm interrupting you because we are almost uh -huh. out of time. You took mm -hmm. short of time. Um, mm -hmm. Just third party opinions, for example, if there are any certificating, certificating pop, uh, bodies or um, thought leaders or opinion leaders in your sector who might claim that you are you're basically a greenwashing or you're bullshitting everybody and if this influences your ability to benefit. Yeah, okay, of course. Uh, uh, we, we verified our material in International uh, Photocatalytic Center in, okay. in UK. Okay, cool. Uh, for example, the companies who have to purchase the emission certificates or quotas, can mm. they purchase less if they use your technology? So can they cut back uh, their actual emissions? Uh, uh, fully or... Uh, not fully, even partly is good enough. Controlling, right? just controlling, not uh, fully break down uh, all, the, okay. all the pollution. Okay, Jürgen, you uh, have a question. The... Yes, I wanted to ask what are the companies using um, this uh, high emissions of Nitrogen, nitrogen oxide. They don't. They don't uh, use uh, when they. Um, uh, just, just for example, a, mm -hmm. which companies do have? Mm -hmm. Which companies do have high emissions? Uh, for example, uh, you maybe know uh, Enefit Green. Uh, from Estonia, they are producing electricity uh, by burning also trash, and they have uh, nitrogen oxide emission. Mm -hmm. And oil companies also during their chemical processes they emit uh, nitrogen oxides. Okay, that, oh, that's just one, that. This is one. Um, are there any any more? Uh, one of my friend was talking about marine uh, industry. I think in marine, marine industry also sulfur oxide and nitrogen oxide is uh, emitted. Okay, Joseph so, uh, switched the camera in already. Many. <laughs> we can find many. I also gave example about ammonia. Ammonia used as a fuel uh, in fuel cell technology uh, and uh, as a product they are uh, emitting also nitrogen oxide. Okay. Cool. Joseph, do you have any comment to add? Yeah, no, I just want to say that Ibrahim, maybe we... Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, Joseph was told, talk. yeah. Maybe we should mm -hmm. talk separately. It would be... yeah. yeah, I will be glad, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. okay, guys, time's up. Thank you for coming. It was really cool. And uh, at least half the companies didn't get to uh, talk today about their environmental impact. I'm sure that uh, we are going to tackle this topic also on, on the mentoring sessions we are going to have. So, Jana, any last words? Um, thank you very much that uh, you have put the guys to talk. Um, you are the first one who was very, very active in this and very successfully active. And of course, we will have the recording and um, please don't forget to put some time slots for the teams for mentoring. I will. I will. And guys, we will have also the oh, stop. I will stop the recording.